For everybody who's here, welcome to the second and final day of the conference, and in some ways, the most interesting. Our first panel will be on media, and that, is, that has many fascinations, but the second panel will be largely Zoom, but it will be reports from various countries, Germany, France, the United States, etc. So I think that the comparative aspect, I think you'll find fascinating, but we're ready to begin, and so, David, all yours. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, our speakers and guests. Let me introduce our first panel in the second day of our conference, Anti-Semitism in Hungary, Appearance and Reality. Our first panel today is Media and Popular Culture, and let me introduce our, our speakers, Professor Laszlo Kürti, Anthropology Professor at the Faculty of Applied Social Sciences at the University of Miskolc. Mr. Janos Gadu, Editor of the Hungarian Jewish Monthly Magazine, Sombat. And Virag Guyas, Journalist, Activist, Representative of the Anti-Jew Hatred Movement in the US. I kindly ask the speakers to please take a seat. I also ask Mr. Kurti to to deliver his speech. Thank you for the invitation. It's very nice to be here today, especially since uh, I met uh, Jeffrey Kaplan 25 years ago, and I have never seen him since. So uh, today I discuss popular anti-Semitism, a topic that permits me a closer examination of a number of intersecting undercurrents. I argue broadly that for anti-Semitism to be taken into account, it has to be understood first, not as a once in a lifetime happening, coming and going from the outside, but as an ingrained, ingrained super organic phenomenon. It's not like a three day cold. There are no ready-made, homemade remedies for anti-Semitism. It is an uphill battle, true and true. The main reason being, anti-Semites may hate Jews, but not only them. And, and understanding anti-Semitism may help us to understand the nature and structure of human evil. As an anthropologist who grew up on Franz Boas and his insightful essays on race, culture, relativity, and social theory, I am against all forms of prejudice stemming from racism, eugenics, or xenophobia, or any kind of orthodoxies of the day. Popular sentiments about race, skin color, genetics, and power of heredity are pervasive both among the elites and among the uneducated, especially those harboring extremist views of various persuasions. I want to stress the name and scholarship of the early pioneer anthropologist, the Austro-American Franz Boas, who almost 100 years ago wrote about these topics. It is with reason that I cite him for I hold the view that at the base of popular anti-Semitism is a primordial racism. The widespread view of the genetic difference and inferiority of the Jews. In contrast, Boaz and his liberal-minded uh, followers claim that culture, upbringing, and socialization together with the environment, including diet, determine our shapes, forms, how we look, how we speak, and how we think, but it also determines our beliefs in gods, the supernatural, and the afterlife. Popular anti-Semitism reject Jewishness, Jewishness because they reject the culture of Judaism. They see worshipers as different people, and in their mind, this difference, what has to be marginalized or even eliminated. Unlike Michael Billing's notion of banal nationalism, that is the mundane and everyday form of nationalism, 
Anti-Semitism has its two major forms. An everyday or routine form of anti-Jewishness that often go unnoticed. But there is the extreme vigilant anti-Semitism. You all know that from the daily news, ranging from desacralizing Jewish cemeteries, painting swastikas, or physically attacking Jewish citizens. What is new, coming often from the left and Islamic extremism, or even Protestant churches, is the hatred of Israel. I do want to make the point about the connection of official political anti-Semitism and popular anti-Semitism, the latter being historic and permanent. However, unlike popular anti-Semitism, the latter being historic and permanent. Unlike popular anti-Semitism, political anti-Semitism is more or less cloaked as secular. From time to time, resentment of Jews and other pariah groups by the populace flares up as a symptom of social problems that states attempt either to diffuse or, in the worst case scenario, even exacerbate. In turn, policies often result in mistakes and unintended actions because they find willing groups and communities already harboring resentments against Jews, or in certain instances, like in case in Hungary, against gypsies or foreigners. So as a social scientist, I have been concerned with the underworld, the underbelly, the things that go often, whether conscious or not, hidden and unnoticed. That is why I focus on popular culture. Films, literature, theater, or even Jewish jokes are well known and profusely discussed by academics. But we seem not to give enough weight for them among the people. As the American philosopher and social critic Cornel West points out, and I quote, the culture of mass distraction generates indifference towards the things that really matter, close quote. This is the problem with popular culture in general and Hungarian popular culture in specific. It plays both cards. On the one hand, maintains virulent attitudes towards issues of race, ethnicity, and religion. Yet it promotes stereotypes of various groups and subcultures by spreading hatred, bigotry, and major majoritarian superiority on the other. Take, for example, the Hungarian television program depicting gypsies or the Romans. For example, I focused earlier on, on, the, on the media depiction of gypsies. I focused, and the Hungarians, you will know, the most ridiculous one is the Jerzyka show. The sitcom has been ongoing since, get this, 2005. It was the first, uh, first year when it was aired on RTL Club. This depicts scandalous everyday frictions of a Roma family. And yet Hungarians laugh at this just like they find anti-Roma jokes funny. But what's, what's terrible is that they also think that this is true. Interestingly, while Jewish jokes are staples of popular culture, blatantly anti-Semitic tropes are rarely, if ever, in Hungarian films or television programs, not counting, of, of course, the extremist channels and radio stations. In these extreme, extreme right media, anti-Semites expressed their worldview recently with labels like this ugly, liberals, urbanites, cosmopolitans, leftists, Bolsheviks, henchmen of George Soros, or simply just the enemies or foreigners, it again in Hungarian. Since George Zimmel, we know who the strangers are. As recently as a few days ago, during the current European Championship match between Germany and Hungary, German police arrested few Hungarian football fans 
for the swastika tattooed on their arms. This is what Michael Billing, uh, paraphrasing Michael Billing, the banal form of anti-Semitism, but it clearly points to several disturbing factors. It is widely known that this white, urban, working class male subculture is openly racist and anti-Semitic. Anybody who, who watches football knows or goes to football uh, uh, matches knows this, but you can also hear it on, on, on television programs. They regularly sing these anthems. The trains are leaving for Auschwitz. This is part of the FTC national, so-called FTC club anthem, Zöld Shoshok, which also has the line in, destroy the stand, or perhaps better translated as, ravage the bleachers, pusti teren in Hungarian. It's not very difficult to see the connection between destroying the bleachers and the trains are leaving for Auschwitz and recalling the Aryan Nazi ideology or the fascist hymn of Ferenc Szálasi, the leader of Hungary's notorious Arrow Cross, World War II fame. And it has exactly the same line, long live Szálasi and Hitler beat up the Jew with a bully stick. This anti-Semitic folklore, of course, is well known to scholars, but what's less well known is that these are regurgitated constantly in popular culture and the new, new anti-Semitic uh, uh, songs. For example, uh, it's very interesting, and I looked at some of the, some of the irredentist uh, song of 1940, 1944, and it's very, very uh, shocking that many of the so-called popular irredentist song of the 19, uh, early 1940s were also very anti-Semitic songs at the same time. Um, one of these songs that, that are actually also sang today by the uh, National Socialist punk bands in, in Hungary is the so-called uh, Sweet Transylvania song, which was translated into an anti-Semitic labor camp uh, song for the, for the Jewish labor camp uh, 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 conscripts. In Hungarian, there was the sweet shawl, sweet shovel instead of sweet Transylvania. It's very interesting, though, when you, when, you, when, you, when you look at how, for example, the Jewish communities related to some of these songs and how they felt about being Hungarian during that time, even though they were rejected by the state as Hungarians. It was Bob Cohen who, who researched some of the Transylvanian Hungarian folk music, and he wrote about one of the songs that he collected from uh, survivors of, uh, of Auschwitz. It's very interesting that he, he, he wrote the text that, um, about the, the, the yellow star, the, the, the Jewish uh, the yellow badge, that, um, that the constant, the, the, in the work camps, the, the laborers were singing the song in Hungarian, not in Yiddish, because the, because the German, German soldiers would understand the Yiddish and they would beat them up. So instead they decided to sing it in Hungarian so the Germans wouldn't understand this. So the reason I'm citing, citing all this, uh, uh, um, these songs is because what is, what is totally, totally mind boggling is that today we still have these things and they are still circulating on the net and inserting in underground uh, uh, clubs in, in, in uh, uh, Hungary. And what's more is that there are plenty of anti-Semitism in Hungarian popular culture and Hungarian folklore. Dozens of anti-Semitic proverbs are known still today and people are constantly uh, referring to them. It's very interesting that in, Hung in Hungary, there are more anti-Roma proverbs than anti-Jewish proverbs, which is totally inverse in Poland. In Poland, there are more anti-Jewish, uh, anti-Roma proverbs and less uh, uh, anti-Jewish uh, uh, proverbs. But even in, even in, in um, folk songs, folk tales, and, um, and even in dances, you have anti-Semitic dances. The obvious message is clear. 
ridicule and rejection of Jewish culture and Jewishness. And of course, we can go back even, even to the, to the uh, uh, late 19th century to see how this continue, continues, continues even today, uh, taking the case from the Tisa Eslar blood libel case, which is today used by the NS uh, bands, uh, uh, such as the blood libel, the natural born killers, Division 88, healthy skinhead, and the final solution bands. And they all constantly play on this anti-Semitic uh, trope. By the way, I have to mention that the line, beat of the Jew, is, is, is not really connected to 1944 and Ferenc Szálasi. It was already used in the 19th century as a slogan, as a part of political campaign in Hungary, which was, of course, the time when, when the anti-Semitic party was also in the Hungarian uh, uh, parliament. But what is more disturbing is the fact that beating of the Jew is a staple of the fall traditions all over Europe. The flogging or burning of Pontius Pilate is part of the Good Friday Easter celebrations all over Catholic Europe, even in Hungary today, where, where a straw dummy of Pilate, sometimes called Judas, is burnt and thrown in a river. So obviously, there's a very fine line between symbolic, or you can call it banal, anti-Semitism, or verbal and actual atrocities, such as beating up the Jews. Hungarian popular anti-Semitism never lost its hold. And a big question is why? I think one, one simple answer, answer is that as long as the education remains the same, and long as the state allows its myriad forms to thrive, it is clear to me that the rejection of Jews and their life ways will continue to inflame, inflame bigotry and racist ideology. Racialization as well as dehumanization of the Jewish people, or even branding Israel as a fascist, fascist state are currently staples of anti semitism And of course, governments don't have to utter openly anti-Semitic anti uh, uh, slogans or rhetorics. But isn't it enough if they simply celebrate certain people who are openly nationalist, racist, and populist? And of course, you all know, living in Hungary, that the cult of Admiral Miklos Horthy, Albert Vosch, or Josef Nire are all cases for this, or of this celebration. And of course, currently, awards given to far-right politicians are also telling of this. And here I want to briefly note one of the mainstays of anti-Semitism found in the populist neo-folk music. And, uh, and a brief detour here. For his part, Anthony Smith has realized that Hungarian populist nationalism, quote, seeks inspiration from, from the communal past in order to link the past, present, and the future together, close quote. This reification and homogenizing attempt what places the neo-folk music and the dance house cultures on a tight rope. They highlight aspects of a mystified peasantry. It truly attempts to connect national community with the highly skewed notion of the past as exemplified by one particular social stratum, the peasantry, especially the Hungarian peasantry of minority culture in Romania. I just want to re, uh, call your attention to the disastrous uh, uh, event of 2015, which was unprecedented in Hungary, when the revival of folk music band Muzikas was pressured to withdraw from the popular Jewish Culture Week in Budapest. What created quite a major uproar was the participation with the band, the ceramicist and the singer Maria Petras. 
She is a wife of a well-known right-wing poet who openly declared his anti-Semitic idea. She also had participated together with him on right-wing events. The opposition of the Association of Jewish Hungarian Congregation resulted in making the singer a persona non grata at the Dohain Street Synagogue. What this case amply illustrates is that populism and anti-Semitism are strangely bedfellows indeed. While, for example, the early American populist movements of the 1930 was not, not anti-Semitic, later, soon, you know, but a decade later, it all turned anti-Semitic. And in Europe, from the very beginning, it was based on anti-Semitic and fundamentalist Christian nationalism. This anti-Semitism has been anchored to the notion that national culture and its essential peasant tradition must not be lost to foreign elements. In the populist minds, peasants and their culture, whatever that means, have been continually under attack. Thus the destruction of their life ways is the result of industrialization, urbanization, and liberalization of entire society caused by certain groups. And of course, the question, who do they have in mind? In addition to these globalizing forces, a recent threat has emerged, which is the Muslim foreign invasion, which is, of course, all crystallized into this conspiracy theory about the international economic interest groups and urban elites and foreigners who appear as our enemies. Obviously, this entails a penchant for oversimplifying, oversimplifying identity, socioeconomic processes and scapegoating just about anyone who is placed outside the Hungarian nation. After posing the question, who's Auschwitz, as he does in the title of, in his crucial essays in 1998, 1998 uh, Imre Kertész does not he hesitate to provide an outright answer. Auschwitz must belong, like, Auschwitz belongs less to the generation of the vic victims, but it must belong to those still to come. But Curtis also adds an equally in, in important proviso, for as long as those generations claim it, and we must claim it. And I think this is the, this is the, the real stress here. A proper example of how to claim it, and what examples we can give to claim this, is a favorite film of mine called The, the Music Box. You've probably seen it. It was a 1989, Golden Bear winning film directed by Costa Gavras, which tells an important story, an important Hungarian story. Briefly, it's an emigre father living in the US who has to face his daughter by admitting that he was an officer in the Hungarian army. An army that was responsible for the heinous crimes committed against the Jewish families during World War II. Why the message of this cinematic revelation is so shocking is because it highlights the secret Hungarians have, for the most part, tried to hide and deny. For a long time, it was the German army and the Germans and the German fascist state who was responsible for the horrors committed against the population during 1940, 1945. The father in the music box, however, has to face the truth that the Hungarian army, as well as the compliant civilians in the hinterland, were all part of the monstrous plan to send Jews to the gas chambers. But look at what happened. It took about 20 years, and Hungarian cinema grew up. We produced such incredible films as The Son of Saul, 1945, 
sunshine. What these cinematic productions will reveal is simple. Unless you are willing to face your actions of the past, feel remorse and repent, you will carry the burden of insidious secrecy and gregarious complicity. Today, the Jew, Jewish man has many, many faces. He is still a boogeyman. In this popular, uh, in this anti-Semitism, popular culture and political culture coalesce. Think of, think of the giant anti shalosh posters dotting the Hungarian landscape a few years ago. Another person, another Jewish boogeyman today is Sasha Baron Cohen, the guy who is famous for the Borat films in Great Britain. Of course, Borat is, is, can be questioned because it is, it, is, it is based on ethnic stereotypes. It is funny, but it's also a questionable mockumentary. It's caricaturing a largely a fictional community of gypsies and of Kazakhstan. But, but what happens? What happens is that there is an organization in Hungary called the Turanic Nations, Turanic Nation, who think that Borat was the liberal West destroying Hungarian ancient Turkic identity. And they actually wrote a letter to, to Hollywood, to various organizations, rejecting this liberal provocation and attack of the tyrannic nations, including the Kazakhs. Okay. Obviously, this is, this is, this is, a, this is a, a kind of a, a mythic and remote uh, contested identity about ancient Hungarian Turkic language and prehistory. And of course, you can always make a claim that uh, this is totally ridiculous. It is a film. It is a film. Just like a few years uh, earlier, there were a whole series of, uh, of South African films called The Gods Must Be Crazy. And now there were like four or five of these films that were made. It was also, also ridiculing tribal uh, 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 African uh, uh, people. So I want to conclude my presentation by stressing that with all the political, scholarly, and artistic projects describing various forms of prejudice, racism, and Jew baiting, there are many more steps we have to take. We are not finished. We are just at the beginning of confronting anti-Semitism. I, I want to rephrase an expression introduced in 1900 by the American scholar and thinker, the activist W.E.B. Du Bois. He wrote at that time that the problem of the 20th century is the problem of racism. But I rephrase it that the problem of the 21st century is the problem of anti-Semitism. We live with the memory and the consequences of what took place in history. As Cartes argued, Auschwitz is everywhere and it belongs to all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Before we move to our next speaker, I would like to introduce you our fourth speaker, Ms. Ruth Isaac from the European Jewish Association, the head of the EU relations. Good morning. Uh, it is an honor to be here with you uh, and be together with such a distinguished panel. The first thing I wanted to say is that, first of all, I'm very happy to see that this event uh, is done by a non-Jewish organization. I think this is uh, one of the most important and key aspects that uh, the issue of anti-Semitism is not a Jewish issue, it's an issue that affects every single one of us. I'm going to expand a little bit on that. But first of all, I want to uh, introduce myself. My name is uh, Ruth, and I have two surnames, one Greek and one Hebrew. So my name is Ruth Daskalopoulou Isaac. So a little bit long, but they're both mine. Um, I wanted to say that I work for the European Jewish Association. Our partners here in Hungary are Action and Protection. You heard of them on a previous panel. And I'm going to talk a little bit about their work and what we are doing together. 
The first thing I wanted to say that I was 13 years old the first time that I experienced an anti-Semitic attack. Uh, I was 13 and people wanted to hit me. Basically, they told me they wanted to hit me and they told me why. And my friends told me to be careful of them because, uh, basically, because my name is Ruth, uh, they just assumed that I was uh, Jewish. So I have, um, all my life, basically, I had a lot of hate against me. And I'm going to tell you later what happened in my life. But and that was just because people assumed that I was Jewish. And uh, today I work for the European Jewish Association. When I tell people that I'm Greek, they don't believe me. They just assume that I'm hiding my identity. Um, I have people uh, three doors away from my house telling me that I'm an Israeli spy. Uh, I lived in a community that unfortunately had a lot of uh, elements, basically, that uh, they were very hostile to Israel. And uh, yeah, so. I experienced different types of anti-Semitism, and uh, when I was 13 years old, that one was from neo-Nazis, stupid young men that just thought it was a cool thing to do. But later on in my life, I saw that anti-Semitism, like for example, I'm inside the European Parliament, I have not met one neo-Nazi or far-right person. Now anti-Semitism seems to, to, at least to me, to be coming from different directions, and that is mainly from um, the anti-Zionist perspective. And, um, Again, I'm just going to touch very briefly on that. So, as I said, I'm very happy to see that other non-Jewish uh, partners and friends are involved in this work. I want to say about Hungary that I, I was very pleasantly surprised to see the amount of work that has been done in this country. I think it is important that uh, we all know the past, we all know what happened, but we also all know that things don't have to be like the previous generation. Uh, humanity has come a very long way what today we call human rights is almost like a miracle. It, a few years ago, uh, or even 100 years ago, if you look at 100 years, it's such a small period of time if you compare to humanity. You know, the fact that today um, the value of life and uh, the value of women, the value of uh, what is uh, right is respected to such a degree is, is really a miracle. And we can work on that to, for things to become better. Together with our partners, as I said, the, the action and protection here in Hungary, we work specifically on the issue of education because we believe that this is the solution. And looking forward, we believe that if we offer more solution and if we involve more partners, uh, more, and more people can be educated about this issue. Um, specifically, I wanted to say that um, in Europe today, the reality is that we see a very big commitment when it comes to dealing with anti-Semitism, and also not only with anti-Semitism, but also uh, valuing Jewish life and valuing the contribution that Jewish people have made, not only today, but throughout history. Um, but this, sometimes this commitment, we see it right at the top. We see it from the president of the European Commission, the vice president, we see the committees, we see it, uh, for example, in the government of Hungary, very much so. But that doesn't necessarily translate in the everyday life and doesn't necessarily translate in what uh, the ordinary maybe or the average person uh, thinks or is not as such a, the same priority. But um, number one, as we said yesterday, um, change does take time. It's not an overnight thing, you know. But uh, the other thing I wanted to say is that, you know, when you work in uh, education and, you know, you have long-term goals, you know, it's going to take one generation maybe for, uh, uh, you know, the young people that are today in schools, for them to become adults and make better decisions. But um, I wanted to say that the reality is that the majority of, uh, of uh, European, because I'm, I, I come from, I'm not from Hungary, I speak on the international perspective. The majority of uh, the, the average, as I said, uh, European person today is not a, exactly anti-Semitic. It's just that most of them, the reality is that they are uh, maybe ignorant or indifferent to this problem. Even for me, although I was aware that anti-Semitism was very much a very big issue and a very big part of the past, basically, of my own country. And um, unfortunately, you know, yesterday, we, and we heard a lot of other statistics when it comes to anti-Semitism and that Hungary has a very big percentage. Unfortunately, in Greece, it's even worse. It's uh, the highest in uh, Europe, which is a very unfortunate thing. But I do have hope, and I have seen that in the last 20, 30 years, there's been an um, immense difference, basically, in attitudes and uh, a far better understanding and a definitely a very big commitment from the government of Greece, both from the right and the left. 
Um, as I said, the majority of people are not aware. Uh, for me personally, um, I was aware that anti-Semitism was an issue. It was almost like a background noise in my life. I could hear the noise. I could see that it was an issue. I could see that there was something like a very specific and very distinct hate when it came to the Jewish people. But I couldn't understand how big the problem was until later in my life, that noise, that background noise became so big that I couldn't ignore it anymore. And I decided to do something about it. And this is how I got involved. And I think I was doing such a good job that some people offered me a job and then another organization offered me a job. And today I'm inside the European Parliament and I'm advocating on these issues. I had the privilege of meeting with uh, the European Parliament Vice President, the European Commission Vice President, uh, members of Parliament, ambassadors. I met the ambassador of Hungary both uh, the bilateral ambassador, the one who's an ambassador to Belgium and the ambassador to the EU. Both of them really wonderful. I also had the, the privilege of meeting the commissioner from Hungary, which is uh, His Excellency, uh, Mr. Oliver Ver Verheli. Yes. Uh, a very strong friend of Israel and the Jewish people. Uh, the commitment, again, that I have seen from him, I, I, obviously it is from the government, but also from him personally. I couldn't lie, I couldn't stand in front of you and say that it wasn't genuine. It was definitely genuine and for that we're very grateful, for sure. Um, the one thing I wanted to touch that I just spoke earlier was about how anti-Semitism has changed. When I was speaking earlier to, just a couple of days ago, to a very major NGO, one of the biggest uh, think, political think tanks in Europe, and I was speaking to them about co cooperating on a project, they said, yeah, we would like to cooperate on the issue of Israel because we think that there is a lot of anti-Israel bias in, in uh, Europe. But uh, I said, okay, but what about the issue of anti-Semitism? Can we do something specifically on that? And they basically said, I don't think that anti-Semitism is a big problem. We don't have as many neo-Nazis today. So for them, it was obvious they were not trying to minimize the problem. It's just that they associated anti-Semitism with neo-Nazis, like if that is the only... Um, the only aspect of anti-Semitism. Unfortunately, as I said today, the anti-Semitism that I have seen is very much uh, left-wing anti-Semitism, very much linked to anti-Zionism and the situation in Israel, which is not any different because it's still anti-Semitism, very much so, and is also a deadly anti-Semitism because terror attacks uh, come from that also. And um, one of the other points I wanted to say is that uh, whether whether uh, anti-Semitism is from the right or the left, whether it is religious or non-religious, or whether it is national or religious in that sense, I, di I differentiate between the two. I just think that uh, there is a solution, and the solution is um, uh, education, as, we said, as I said before. Um, when we, we had the privilege, again, of meeting with ministries of education from around Europe, and with ministers themselves. And we see that they are, number one, they are willing to work on this. They are willing to put it as a priority in their agenda. They're even willing to change the textbooks. And for me, this is, the, this is a major thing, you know, for a country to, and for a minister and for a government to, to go as far as change their own textbooks and revise and be willing to give us the privilege of working with them. Well, for me, this is huge. And it really shows that clear commitment. Now, this commitment, unfortunately, doesn't always translate down. We don't see the same commitment from teachers. Teachers themselves, sometimes, they have um, a very strong bias towards, for example, Israel or towards other issues. So it seems that even education, before we even reach the children, sometimes we also have to work with teachers themselves. Um, but in all of these meetings that we had, as I said, from, I also had the privilege of uh, bringing a delegation to Israel of about 200 people. The first time I went to, uh, sorry, I meant, I also had, yes, I had the delegation that I took them to Israel, but I had the delegation that I took them to Auschwitz. And the first time that I went to Auschwitz, I really wanted to go all my life. And the first time I went, I didn't go alone. I actually brought 200 people with me. Hundreds of them, more or less, they were politicians, including from the European Parliament. And um, uh, I was just an individual that I really cared. I saw a problem. I heard the background noise. I thought it was important, and I felt that it was my responsibility to do something. And uh, by the grace of God, I was able to uh, have the opportunity to do these things. In uh, November, we have our second delegation, and this time, uh, this delegation is specifically with ministries of education. And from countries that, are, that don't even have a big 
have, like basically have a very small uh, percentage of Jewish people in the country, but still they have such a commitment to really come and learn and work with us. So this is the, the humble and short message I want to give with you that uh, solutions are available, that there are wonderful people just like this panel and just our friend uh, Virak, that maybe they're not Jewish, but they are getting involved. Uh, they take this issue very seriously and they're willing not only to uh, raise awareness but also work towards solutions and uh, towards things that can really make a difference. Thank you. Uh, before we move to our next speaker, please be informed that questions after the panel and the end of the panel are welcomed. I would like to give the floor to Mr. Janos Gadu, editor of the Hungry and Jewish Monthly Magazine, Sombat. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for this invitation. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Uh, the title of my paper, which did not appear in the program, is Old School Antisemitism and New School Anti-Zionism. Uh, uh, I, as I uh, was listening to the previous lectures, I understand that this issue is not new. It has been treated uh, this morning and yesterday, so I may, I will probably repeat uh, some thesis which, had, which had been said uh, yesterday, but I think the context uh, is uh, rather new. So I'm sorry for reading this paper. I prefer to read uh, because I don't trust my English uh, so much. So let me start. Contemporary Hungarian government policy toward the Jews is a reversed image of progressive Western politics. Progressive Western public opinion, media and NGOs are strongly pro-Palestinian and highly critical of Israel. The Orban government has been firmly pro-Israel over the past couple of years and seems pretty unin seems pretty uninterested in listening to Palestinian grievances. Hungarian representatives, just like their Polish, Czech, Slovak colleagues in many cases, don't rush to condemn Israel in various EU and UN bodies, obstructing this way the adoption of a unified European position critical on Israel. In, in progressive Western public opinion and the media, Holocaust consciousness is crucial. Progressive politicians bow their head to the victims of the Holocaust and basically acknowledge their respective nations' responsibility for the extermination of European Jewry. In Orban Victor's Hungary, the memory of the Holocaust is important, but it is not supposed to overshadow the grievances of the Hungarian nation in the past or in the present. Hungarian politicians bow their head to the victims of the Holocaust but won't really acknowledge their nation's responsibility for the tragedy of the Hungarian Jewry. However, in official messages to the Jewish community, they do admit the responsibility of the Hungarian state. The progressive West steps over the traditional 20th century religious national worldview, exposes 21st century multiculturalism and regards the respect of the other as the core of its policy. This policy is supposed to be a safe haven for Jews who once, as the ultimate others, were victims of the vilest persecutions. It is supposed to be a safe haven for Jews, but it isn't, unfortunately, we have to admit. Unlike in the progressive West, in Hungary, the other, it's often the migrants, is considered as suspicious, strange, frightening, it is someone insensitive to Western democratic culture. It is someone uh, who does not respect women and hates Jews in uh, Hungarian government's interpretation. In Orban Victor's Hungary, the traditional early 20th century Christian nationalistic worldview is still alive and valid, but unlike in the 1930s when it was heavily anti-Semitic, it is now said by the government to be a safe haven for the Jews who in the multicultural West are harassed and persecuted by a coalition of Muslim immigrants and far-left politicians. 
Only a strong nation state like Hungary can be able to protect the gates of Europe, which would be otherwise inundated by the hordes of anti-Zionist and anti-Semitic immigrants who represent lethal danger for the Jews. At least, at least this is how the Hungarian government argues. Progressive Western political culture regards the Orban government as anti-democratic and anti-Semitic at the same time. It is accused of pursuing 20th century old school anti-Semitism. In the traditionalist political culture of the Orban government, it is the progressive West which should be accused of anti-Semitism. More exactly, it is accused of pursuing the 21st century new school anti-Zionism as it is often referred to. In the progressive West, the good Jew is one who exposes multiculturalism and keeps his, her distance toward the traditional notions of Jewish nation and religion. In traditional Central Europe, the good Jew is someone who exposes the traditional notions of nation and religion and rejects multiculturalism. To put it very bluntly, in Western Europe, in multicultural Jews are the good guys and Zionist Jews are the bad guys. In Central Europe, Central Eastern Europe, multicultural Jews like George Soros are the bad guys and the religious nationalist Jews are the good guys, provided that these good Jews don't oppose strongly the Holocaust discourse of the government. The Hungarian government's policy in this respect is closest to that of modernized Western far-right parties such as Rassemblement National of Marine Le Pen uh, or the German AfD. One crucial difference is worth mentioning. Western far-right political parties often strive to limit the Jewish and Muslim religious practices like circumcision and ritual slaughtering. The Orban government acts the opposite way. It encourages Jewish religious practice and promotes kosher slaughtering, such as the building of a brand new meat factory in Cengele, exporting kosher products to Western Europe and Israel. As it might be seen from the previous chapter, in our time, a new fragmented version of anti-Semitism has emerged and opposing political currents or movements accuse each other of various kinds of anti-Semitism. Progressive multiculturalists blame the anti-Semitic conspiracy theories of Eastern European nationalists, while these latter ones blame the anti-Israeli obsession of the progressives. Each party has got its beloved kind of Jew and its Jewish bogeyman. Gone are the days of the 20th century when all the forms of hating Jews came from one direction, from one political camp. One of the last genuine fascist parties of our time, the Hungarian Jobbik, turned under our noses into a modern nationalist anti-establishment party, which rejects for its own former Jew hatred and sends Rosh Hashanah greetings to the Jewish community. If you want to find genuine, full-fledged full Jew hatred, you will find it mostly in the Islamic world. European Jew hatred fell into pieces and different political camps picked up some of these pieces. There is no point in asking anymore whether this or that person or political party is anti-Semitic. You better ask what melange of philo and anti-Semitism he or it promotes. Let's call it a postmodern anti-Semitism and postmodern image of the Jews. Old models do not work. 50 years before, the Soviet Union was anti-democratic, anti-Semitic and anti-Zionist. From Jewish perspective, it was on the wrong side, no doubt. In 2021, the Swedish government is progressive, democratic and rather anti-Zionist. The Hungarian government is anti-liberal, rather anti-democratic and pro-Zionist. Which government is on the right side and which is on the wrong side? The question of anti-Semitism in Hungary should be understood against this background. Hungary, democracy, self-reflection. This is a subtitle. In the glorious year of 1989, the nations of the former Soviet bloc secured themselves the right to build up the same democratic institutions which had been long established in the Western part of Europe. 
Operating democratic institutions is a challenge and requires a high degree of political maturity. This is not obvious in every case, as we could see around 2010 during the tumultuous years of the Arab Spring. The new democracies of the former Soviet bloc, nevertheless, provided proof of this maturity. However, by this time, Western democracies had achieved a higher level of maturity. The culture of self-reflection mentioned above was gaining ground. The history of the Holocaust, the responsibility of the nations for the destruction of the Jews of Europe proved to be a major factor in this development. The countries of Western Europe definitely set out on this path and got quite far. As a consequence, the traditional romantic 19th century image of the nations has suffered irreparable damage. It was this kind of maturity which proved to be too much of a challenge for the new democracies. They stopped at this point, hesitated, and started to retreat. Most nations of post-Soviet Europe were reluctant to embark on the path of this soul-searching. They abhorred its consequences. In this part of Europe, the grievances of the nations are too deep to forget, and the crimes committed by these same nations are too grave to, to be confronted with. Self-reflection and soul-searching is not unknown in this part of the world, but it is not a majority behavior. Over the past 10, 15 years, this culture has been, more, has, has been even more marginalized in many of these countries. It became a tolerated minority opinion while unreflecting nationalism prevailed. The latter became a semi-official opinion cultivated by newly, newly established institutions. Hungary and Poland are the best known examples of this kind of restoration. Holocaust research is an established discipline in these countries, but, it's, but the results of Holocaust research are frightening and are distressing for the nationalist mind. Collaboration or indifference toward the Jews in these countries during the Holocaust was much more common than selfless help. The glorified nation, allegedly a victim, proved to be very different in reality. This disappointing picture is simply intolerable for the new nationalist right which has come to power in these countries. Countering this unfavorable image became imperative for the new right, which took serious, serious measures to promote the traditional image of the nation. The best known example is the infamous Polish law that makes it an offense to attribute Nazi crimes to the Polish nation or the Polish state. This is tantamount to legally restrained free speech and historical research. <coughs> In Hungary, the government has established new institutions to promote the government agenda in the realm of social sciences, history, and letters. The Veritas Institute, established in 2013, has an undeclared mission. It is to whitewash the record of the authoritarian and anti-Semitic Horthy regime, which is regarded by many nationalists as a political ideological predecessor of the current government. Victor Orban's New Europe and the Jews' Place in It, subtitle. When Victor Orban came to power in 2010, the press was free, so was the far-right press, which blamed the Jews for all evils of the world. The infamous Hungarian-language Nazi website, Kurutz.info, not only encouraged anti-Jewish hatred, but also mobilized for violence by publishing names and addresses of people it deemed as enemies. Viktor Orban took advantage of the far right when seizing the power, but later he disciplined the far right as well. This government with anti-democratic tendencies strives to limit the freedom of speech. Consequently, it limits the freedom of speech of anti-Semites as well. The mass migration of 2015 was his best chance and he, and he used it entirely. The challenges of the world had been reinterpreted. 
Migrants became the danger number one. They overshadowed the Jews. It was crucial. Anti-Semites were earlier, not surprisingly, pro-Palestinians. In 2014, the Jobbik party demonstrated together with the Palestinians in Budapest against Israel. After 2015, the Palestinians, like other migrants, landed on the wrong side where the enemies of Europe are gathering to inundate the old continent. In 2019, in this new setting, when Palestinians demonstrated again in Budapest against Israel, protesting the media coverage of the latest Gaza conflict, they remained alone. The Hungarian right, the Hungarian far right, could not be seen with them. This shift had reinforced the earlier message. Those threatened by the Muslims can be our allies. If you are not a liberal, cosmopolite, pro-migrant Jew, but a traditionalist, nationalist Jew, you can be on our side. It is a clear proposal how the Jewish issue could be solved, who is on the right side and who is on the wrong side. This is a clear proposal about, so to say, a new alliance. Unfortunately, to Viktor Orban, most Hungarian Jews are liberal cosmopolites. They are mostly not interested in religion, abhor Hungarian nationalism, and are distrustful of Jewish nationalism as well. They are not likely to heed this message. In the atmosphere that motiv in, it is this atmosphere that motivated András Heisler, the president of the official representative body of the Hungarian Jews, Mojihis, when he stood up defiantly against the infamous anti soros campaign and urged Viktor Orban in no uncertain terms to stop it. Somewhat later, Heisler also opined that it is awkward for Jews to live in an atmosphere of constant search for enemies. Encouraged by this, some oppositional civil groups invited Heisler and Majihis to take part in the forthcoming protest actions. Politely but resolutely, Heisler declined. We cannot take the role of opposition parties, Heisler explained. Majihis must be careful since 80% of its revenues comes from government resources. These are various uh, forms of compensations, mostly. This is not the attitude of the other important Jewish religious denomination, uh, the United Hungarian Israelite Faith Community, EMICH, established by Chabad's Hungarian branch and led by Rabbi Kveh Shlomo. Kveh Shlomo cooperates more, more closely with the government and offers direct political support when necessary. This was the case when Kove stated that the anti soros campaign has no anti-Semitic overtones. Shlomo Kovesh has major projects which enjoy generous government funding, like the building of the kosher slaughterhouse mentioned above. The Orban government and the memory of the Holocaust. The issue of Hungarian responsibility for the Holocaust has remained a crucial and unresolved problem in Hungarian Jewish relations. From the communication of the Orban government, a certain solution can be deduced. The essence of this solution is this. The Hungarians recognize the immensity and the uniqueness of the Holocaust. In exchange, the Jews will stop accusing the Hungarian nation for the crimes of the Holocaust. Admitting a certain amount of Hungarian responsibility is tolerable for the government. As Gergely Gulyás, Minister of the Prime Minister's Office, declared on the occasion of the International Holocaust Memorial Day in 2019, the Hungarian state bears a responsibility for not protecting its citizens during the Holocaust, but there is no collective guilt uh, but there is a state responsibility. Two years later, Gergely Gulyás' judgment about the Hungarian responsibility was somewhat more severe. A narrow eight decades ago, Hungarian Jewry had not been protected by its own homeland, said Gulyás. Moreover, especially after the German occupation, the Hungarian state also contributed to the horrors by thought, word, deed, and omission. Unquote. 
in order to convey the government's message about the Holocaust, a new Holocaust memorial site and memorial center had been planned, the so-called House of Fates. This is not the first Holocaust memorial center in Budapest. The first one was the Holocaust Memorial and Documentation Center, inaugurated in 2005 by a previous socialist government. However, this institution emphasized the Hungarian responsibility for the Holocaust. Therefore, it did not fit the government's narrative, the new the Orban government's narrative. The House of Fates was to be located in a smaller railway station uh, out of service by this time. Only the reconstruction of the building has been completed because in 2015, a vigorous protest of local and foreign Jewish organizations prevented the installment of the exhibition. Protesting Jews demanded to see the scenario of the exhibition and the organizers refused to, refused to deliver this. Respectable institutions like the Yad Vashem expressed criticism which resulted in a deadlock. This lasted some three years when the re-elected Orban government made another effort to accomplish the project. They decided to involve a Jewish partner, Shlomo Kovesh and his community, Emich. And Rabbi Shlomo Kovesh held a press conference together with Maria Schmidt, the government semi-official historian. They stressed that the exhibition would be opened that very year and emphasis should be given to so, to so to say universal moral conclusions which in Jewish circle was interpreted as avoiding the question of Hungarian responsibility. As it could be expected a new wave of protest followed and the deadlock remained. There is no time here to go into further details. Kavesh and his team have been working on the project virtually secretly ever since. Presumably, they prepare to present a fully completed exhibition to the general public. But that is, he failed to bridge the disagreement between the government and the Hungarian Jewish community in this regard. Conclusion. Orban Victor and his government is struggling with the memory of the Holocaust blaming a rich Jewish businessman and Brussels bureaucrat for the hardships Hungary has to endure, is whipping up xenophobic atmosphere, establishing a political culture of confrontation and scapegoating, praising Israel for its democratic achievement in a hostile region, forging a political alliance with the Jewish state, generously funding Jewish religious institutions and other Jewish projects declaring zero tolerance to anti-Semitism, encouraging the cult of some anti-Semitic writers, cherishing the memory of the authoritarian and anti-Semitic court regime. All this is certainly a mixed blessing. The last chapter, disclaimer. I feel tempted to end my presentation saying something like this. When at some point, the post-Soviet countries will have the courage and strength to face their own past, they will undergo a catharsis and will be able to join the community of developed Western countries. However, in the West, the culture of soul-searching has led to another crisis. Western nations did look into the mirror that post-Soviet countries don't want to see and the image what Western countries saw there was frightening. And they can't help trying to get rid of this image, consciously or not. Anti-Zionism is the best tool for this purpose. All you need to claim is that the Jewish state is committing genocide, crimes against humanity, etc., etc., which means that the Jews, or Israel, are just as guilty as we are, which means that we don't owe them anything anymore. In the progressive West, anti-Zionism is out of hand. In Western capitals, pro-Palestinian rioters are attacking synagogues and are harassing people whom they identify as Jewish. 
This is already the subject of another lecture. Opinion makers in the Western world had the courage to look for honest answers to the questions which had been raised by the Holocaust. However, not the best answers seem to have been found, and the Jews are the first to suffer the consequences. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gado, to sharing your views and your precious thoughts with us. And now I will give the floor Ms. Vira Gryash, journalist, activist, representative of the End Jew Hatred Movement in the US. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. So I am sure you know that we have an eight second attention span. So I actually have a lot to do in the next 25 minutes to keep you awake and here. And I know that it's not a ladylike, but I'm actually a cursor, but I promised Professor Kaplan that I won't curse here. So I'm actually calling social media to do that for me. But before I actually get to the gist of my presentation, everywhere I go, this is my first slide, every talk I give is in memory of Ari Fuld, a friend of mine who was killed just because he was a Jew. And we have a hashtag that we try to trend, be an Ari, be a mensch. So our representation is dedicated to him. And now back to the topic at hand. Number one, let's go further. And then this is from last week from New York City. Restaurant goers are being attacked. And now some pictures, because the line is long. This is a Jewish person who was severely attacked. That is a sign I took a picture of in New York City on a metro. This is Roger Waters from Pink Floyd. You might like his music, but that's actually what he's standing for. This is also from two days ago, the Dyke March in Chicago. That's their advertisement, because why not? That is in San Francisco. This is again the Dyke March with Palestinian flags. This is New York City. And this is uh, Netherlands. So this is 2021 and not 1933. Primarily, I was really asked to talk about the digital media and social media and the influencer marketing when it comes to anti-Semitism. So there are so many angles we could approach it, but I'm trying to bring you something of an added value. Nowadays, my primary location is New York City, so that's where I live, and I help Jewish nonprofits to actually uh, help you know make rallies and help campaigns, digital campaigns, and help them fight anti-Semitism. None of them is actually really important in Hungary or needed in Hungary. Would that mean that Hungary is perfect and we don't have anti-Semitism? Obviously not. I mean, let's not kid ourselves. I also don't believe that we can stop anti-Semitism in any form or eliminate it at all. But what I mean, we cannot you know undo human nature. It is there. But what we can do, and I think what Hungary is doing pretty well, is minimizing the level of anti-Semitism. And hearing the speakers yesterday, you know, there is this battle of statistics and numbers, which is uh, very important as well. But one thing we do not touch upon, the quality and the type of anti-Semitism. There is a huge difference between someone in a village in Hungary at a pub talking about Jewish jokes. That, for me, equates with blonde, blonde girl jokes. There is no difference in terms of ignorance. And there is this kind of anti-Semitism that I showed you, where actually Jewish people are attacked for being a Jew. I have the honor, actually, to serve at a board in Hungary, and a nonprofit is doing uh, something of a media watch activity. So what we do is we are checking the media in Hungary, how they are covering the Israeli-related issues, especially in war situations. So without polarizing the audience here, I need to break the news. In Hungary, it's actually the left-leaning media who is somewhat biased towards what's happening in Israel. Starting with a very, very important thing is legitimizing Hamas, a terrorist organization. That's a big problem when a media is actually picturing them as a freedom fighter. 
that's where you go all wrong. So why, why is it important? Because if in the media, very educated, skilled, quote unquote, credible people are able to write this down and without you know, any balanced view, then what do we expect from social media platforms where basically everyone and everyone can be a reporter? So let's, let's see what happened during the month of May when actually Israel had some heated situation, as we know. Social media yet again failed to offer facts. And what it did, we created a very per uh, perception-based reality, quote unquote, on social media. And the platforms amplified a false narrative. Again, we can just shred our shoulders, say, who cares, you know, whatever, let's move on. But the moment there is one person who dies because of what happens on social media, we realize and we need to realize that we have a huge problem. And it happened. Jewish people were stabbed because of the narrative that's spreading, being spread on social media. And that is extremely important. There is a clear connection, actually, between um, online anti-Semitic hatred and racist hateful comments and images and what happens off offline. This is not a theory, this is a fact. Combined, with, combined that with an increasing level of ignorance and a lack of regulation when it comes to social media and you arrive to a very catastrophic situation, so that is 2021 that we are facing. But again, what I said in the beginning, there are really, really big differences between offline word and online word, but also between countries. So when it comes to Hungary and the EU, we are way more regulated than the other side of the ocean, the free world, United States of America. So here are, for example, some numbers, like 21% of Americans between age 18 and 29 know nothing about the Holocaust, but like nothing. But the same people have zero issue to create a hashtag on Twitter that says Hitler was right. 63% of Generation Z and the millennials in the US do not know that 6 million Jews were killed, but the very same people don't shy away from sending me messages that I should die in a guest chambers with the Jews. Only in New York City, 20% of the same generation believes that the Jews caused the Holocaust. And if you ask them, they also do not see any problem in the statement. They don't think it's, it's racist or anti-Semitic or whatsoever. So when people ask me whether I have any cultural shock over there, being a Hungarian, well, the number one culture shock is the First Amendment right in America. That is a huge difference, that of from Hungary and the EU. The First Amendment rights gives you so much freedom of expression and freedom of speech that basically I need to check my sanity sometimes. How is that actually freedom of speech and not hate speech? There is a really fine line. For example, we celebrated Israel's birthday in Washington Square Park, which is a big uh, you know, center in, in Manhattan, and the pro-Palestinian people were burning up Israeli flags and American flags right in front of me with three police officers here. And I asked them, how is that allowed? They said free speech. And I was like, mm -hmm, sure. Teachers in Florida openly say, I cannot teach you Holocaust because I'm not sure it happened. That person in Florida was fired, then rehired, then fired, and now rehired again. AKA there was zero consequences for his Holocaust denial. Jewish kids on college campuses are attacked every day. There is a something called Nagba Week. Nagba is, you know, the expulsion of the Palestinian people. So I can make a comparison. Basically, it would be like Romanians would have a happy Trianon day where they are burning Hungarian flags and wiping out Hungary from the map of the world. So that's what it equates to when you go to a Nagba Week. That is horrendous. You don't feel safe. And why do I need to get death threats every day just because I'm a Zionist? Obviously, I'm not alone, but I can talk from my experience. So the differences need to be emphasized. And here is some comparison. Hungary is way more regulated. Some would say, yeah, we don't have freedom of speech. Well, let's be very honest. This conference could not come to fruition if you would not have a freedom of speech because you, we have heard some speakers who are absolutely anti-government. So in a country where there is no free speech, that could not happen. So let's be very realistic here. We have a zero tolerance for anti-Semitism. 
and I'm going to compare it to the US, because of the First Amendment rights, you do not have. There are so many videos when I'm doing my researches that I can access in America, but I cannot access in Europe because of that reason, mainly Holocaust denial and incitement for violence. Mandatory Holocaust education in Hungary. Yes, we were taken to the Holocaust Museum as 16 years old kids. And yes, I went back to my history book now as an adult and I checked how it was portrayed. And no, I haven't, said, I haven't actually found a sentence that would deny Hungary's responsibility in the Shoah. So again, it is mandatory to know about Holocaust, like Holocaust. Whereas in the States, only 15 states actually require some kind of Holocaust education. This is why many Americans think that Hitler was a cool guy. Denying Holocaust in Hungary is a felony. Whereas again, in the US, it is absolutely not. In Hungary, Hungarian people don't wake up with the Israeli-Palestinian situation, right? So it's not our daily basis. It's, there are some people who are interested in it. Some people have an opinion. Most people are actually very ignorant or oblivious about it. Whereas in the US, there are protests every day, especially when there is some action going on in Israel. And here is my uh, eight second check on you guys. So do you know that actually the United Nations have no definition on what terrorism is? It's a pity um, cognitive dissonance here when an organization was created to sustain peace, but we do not define what the opposition of peace is, right? Imagine if they would actually have a definition, maybe China, Cuba, Pakistan, Russia would not sit on the United, uh, Uni United Nations Human Rights Council. Why is this a problem? Because we have the same with anti-Semitism. Actually, we do not properly have a definition that's accepted. I mean, we have the IRA definition that nobody seemed to mention here yet, which is very important, especially that Hungary is a member of the committee that came up with this definition. You can see that it says anti-Semitism is a certain perception of Jews which may be expressed as hatred towards Jews. Rhetorical and physical manifestation of anti-Semitism are directed toward Jewish or non-Jewish individuals and or their property toward Jewish community institutions and religious facilities. This definition, in my opinion, is pretty correct and a minimum benchmark base that we need to use. But so many people, including some fellow Hungarian academia people, they are targeting this definition, saying that this is against free speech and actually this definition would stop you from criticizing Israel. That's really far stretch, if you ask me. But how actually anti-Semitism translates in practice? Let's see, so I'm talking about social media purely. In practice, it looks like call to violence. So these are the posts that are actually going all around um, the social media, for example, how to stab a Jew. That's called a digital uh, intifada, 2015, when there were images, how to stab a Jew. That was circulating on Facebook. You can still find it, but actually it was so precise that it showed you on the picture how to make sure that that Jew actually dies. That is when actually, and close to that time, is when Ari Field was murdered, the person that I showed you in the beginning. Holocaust denial. Jews invented the Shoah to get a state. How convenient. The anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. When COVID uh, broke out, there was a trending hashtag, COVID-1948, uh, basically the creation of Israel. Zionism is a replacement world for basically Jew hatred. So the Jewish collectivity. So when people actually ranting on the streets from the river to the sea, who knows where it is from? Because it's a peaceful social justice protest, right? To help the Palestinian people. Let me break the news. From the river to the sea is in the Hamas charter. Hamas is a designated terrorist organization. And the moment you say that that's okay to go on the street shunting from the river to the sea, that means basically that you eliminate the whole Jewish state. That is why anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. And just like we talked with my colleague from uh, NGO Monitor yesterday when the question came up, you know, like how actually you, where does it, why is it problematic to say that anti-Zionism is anti-Israel anti and anti-Zionism are actually anti-Semitism without mentioning the word Jew in it. It's because, as we discussed, that being a Jew is not simply a religion. It's a race. It's being part of a nation. So we could easily say that anti-Zionism is basically anti-Jewish. 
And sometimes I do think we need to reclaim certain narratives for people to understand, such as we need to reclaim the definition of Zionism, which is a beautiful word in and of itself, especially as a patriotic Hungarian. I need to tell you, it's nothing less than I have the right to my own country. The Jewish people have the right to their own country. It was perverted and we let it being perverted. And that's a problem. But let's go back to media because there are some very dangerous things happening there. Contents glorifying the Palestinian militants group can fly without deletion. Full-fledged stabbing intifada, as I said, and digital pogroms can totally fly without deletion. Why? Because neither Twitter nor Facebook, YouTube or Instagram actually signed up for the era definition. They are all saying, oh my God, yeah, we are fighting hate speech, but they let this flyer easily going on for, for weeks. They have groups for terrorist organizers and organizations. And look at how many anti-Semitic tweets were counted two years ago. And I understand that on the big scale, it doesn't look so big, but when it comes with death threats and then those people go on the street and actually attack Jews, then that's a huge, huge problem. On the other hand, Zionist voices, conservative voices, are all the time deleted. My personal Facebook account was deleted after nine years without any warning signs. I wasn't in Facebook jail, like everyone knows what it means nowadays. I was just deleted, eliminated, <laughs> just like that. And I don't even understand why, I don't know why. And here again, there are big differences between countries because I don't know how much you know about how it works that you post something and then the technicalities behind the scenes and the algorithm are actually tracking your words, what you use. But it's so important, you cannot use Jew, but you can use Jewish. Jew is a trigger word, Jewish is not. When you post something with Zionist in it, you cannot boost, meaning you cannot actually market it on social media because it's gonna be blocked. But then again, these things, what I showed you before, can actually fly without a problem. So in America, it's very computerized because America is huge, but there are also people who are assigned by Facebook to actually check what is hate speech and what is not on their social media platform. So it's very interesting that in Hungary, whoever is a journalist, we all know who is that one person sitting in Hungary, hired by Facebook, who is checking what we post. And I know it's a sensitive topic to say censorship because I was born in 85. I still know what actually censorship really means. I know what my parents had to go through during the regime, but I'm not using this word just for the sake of triggering. It is censorship when I get death threats for being a Zionist, but how to kill a Jew can easily, you know, being promoted. I'm working in this field for a decade. I helped very huge campaigns. So what I'm saying is really not a subjective opinion. During our last rally that actually I had the pleasure of, of and the honor of organizing during the month of May, we named it Unite Against Terrorism. Christians and Jews were coming together in solidarity with what was happening in Israel and also in solidarity with all the Jews being attacked in uh, New York and in Los Angeles. Facebook deleted the event on the spot, we were blocked. Because we use the word terrorism, I understand it's a triggering word, but still. There are groups on Facebook that when the war was happening in Israel, all the people whose name was indicating that they were Jewish, they were kicked out from the group. So these things are very dangerous game. So the bottom line here is, this is a Twitter post that is still going on. Hitler did nothing wrong. His only failure was he didn't finish the job. Seems very innocent, right? This is a BBC a reporter. She was actually fired, so at least there were consequences for something. So these are just like numbers. Uh, actually, this is two years ago. It's been way higher ever since. But you can see, you know, that the name, like the traditional, the new anti-Semitism, Holocaust, denial, violence, Facebook is ruling, which I actually think Twitter is way more hateful than Facebook. And YouTube is definitely a dangerous platform. But if anyone has young kids, then watch out for TikTok, because TikTok is a dangerous game to play. The recent challenge was how to hit a Jew. That's why you saw people in Jerusalem 
going around and hitting Jews randomly because it was fancy and it was trendy. It was a TikTok challenge. And who doesn't want to be part of a TikTok challenge and be cool? Before I get to that, something very important to mention. And this is a little off topic from the presentation, but you need to understand the big picture. And that is a soci sociological issue of this generation of millennials, so my generation and the generations after. This generation is continuously seeking for a meaning in life. Most of this generation was born into a comfort, in a peacetime, to free democracies. They have zero idea what communism really means. In as much that at Columbia University, when I presented there, those kids tried to convince me that communism is a good thing. That was a really ambivalent situation to be at. Um, I needed to tell them that that's not, not free bread for all kind of situation. But the point I'm trying to make is that this generation is in a way very lost when it comes to meaning. And social media is their first source of news. And another presentation I gave, I asked actually college kids, what do you want to be when you graduate? And the answer was, I want to be famous. There is actually human resource studies about that, that whereas our parents' generation wanted to be doctors, lawyers, or the traditional jobs, fame was someone, somewhere on the top, like the down bottom. Our generation just wants to be famous, and famous by tomorrow. Social media is the perfect tool for that. It's very easy to become someone overnight. You find which hashtag is trending, you ride the waves, the next day you can be on the uh, cover page of New York Post. Who doesn't want that? And that's the problem, because when the hashtag Hitler was right is trending, there comes a person who doesn't even know who Hitler was, but sees the opportunity to become someone, will ride that wave. Well, let me remind you of something else, the level of threshold that this generation needs to be triggered. When there was a terrorist attack in, in Austria during the pandemic, I'm sure you remember, there were videos taken from a window which showed basically how one person is killing the other person. And that video went viral. Why could it be posted by default? Like the moral question is there. How can we post someone killing another person? Because this generation has zero boundaries. They just want to go viral. And you need to understand that when it comes to social media, they are living off from influencers. So for example, Malala, what comes to your mind when I tell her name? Oh, social justice warrior, right? She suffered so much. She was at the UN. She's someone very peaceful. And then she writes, the violence in Jerusalem, especially against children, yeah, is unbearable. This long conflict has cost many children and their lives and their futures. Leader must act immediately. There is no peace when children and civilians are not safe. Sure. Basically, if a kid died in Jerusalem, it probably was an Israeli kid being stoned by an Arab, like, let's be honest again. Here is another one. I loved Pink Floyd when I grew up. I loved the wall. I, you know, I grew up on that. But today, Roger Waters is at the poster boy of the BDS campaign, the boycott sanction, divest and sanction movement. He enjoys that. I mean, he got all the fame he wanted. He can be drunk and have videos going viral. He is really in shape when he's doing that. So his rants are actually nothing new under the sun. Then we have Suzanne Sarandon. She just posted, what's happening in Palestine is settler colonism, military occupation, land theft, and ethnic cleansing. If she said so, it must be true. And it's really, really like this. I can't emphasize enough. There is an influencer called Bella Hadida. She has four times more followers than the full Jewish population. So imagine the impact it's called in, in my jargon, clout. So she is such an influencing factor. She actually poses as a Palestinian refugee. Need, I mean, who minds that actually she is a millionaire and her father is a millionaire? She's still a refugee because the United Nations said so. Palestinian refugee status is the only inheritable status. So she lives in New York. She is extremely rich and still a refugee and talks on behalf of the refugees. And she participated in most of the rallies in New York, extremely violent. So whatever she says, 
these kids are eating it up. On the other hand, when you are Jewish and you post something, the second after it's identifiable that you are Jewish, you get the free Palestine, stop killing the kids, stop the genocide kind of hashtags. You didn't talk about Shabbat, you didn't talk about Bar Mitzvah. You are a Jew who, I don't know, posted some happy sunset pictures, but the moment someone knows that you are Jewish, this is the response you get. So there is some dichotomy here as well. Social media is definitely the reason why Jews are being attacked more and more. And if you ask me, the BDS and the pro-Palestinian movements are absolutely winning this public uh, relations war by influencer marketing. They nailed it. They really invested in it. They really know how to, how to trick people. And the only difference between the Nazi and the Arab boycotts and the current online BDS and pro-Palestinian company is simply branding. Back then, it was the Nazis. Now, oh, we are human justice warriors. We just want good for everyone, except when it comes to the Jews, obviously. Extremely good branding, really. And this is somewhere the Jewish community absolutely fails. There are so many different, like, I'm working with, with wonderful clients, but what I'm seeing is how the competition is always there between the Jewish communities. And I understand we all need the funding and we all need, you know, the help. But what the BDS is doing when they go on the street, they don't have ego, they have one enemy and they focus on that one enemy. And that's why they become actually very strong. Facts do not matter anymore at all. Emotions do. Because after all, like when I showed you the dyke march and the, the Palestinian flags, do you think that the LGBTQ community could march in Gaza for two seconds before they are being lynched? And yet they are there with the pro-Palestinian flag. Basically, we are building up a world of perceptions forced on us. This is why it's very important what I said in the beginning, how the Hungarian media justifies terrorism or certain parts and elements of the Hungarian media. And they do not spell out that Hamas is a terrorist organization. It is a huge disservice to everyone. Let's uh, speed up a little bit the things because I'm running out of time. The situation in Hungary is actually not horrible, regardless of <clears throat> what we have heard. It's really not horrible. There are so many ignorant people in Hungary, let's be honest. And that's the problem. So yes, when the foreign minister is going to Israel, if you go to his social media platform, you're going to see a lot of ignorant anti-Semitic comments. Granted, there are also pro-Palestinian marches in Hungary. And there are also anti-Israel groups in Hungary. But a little trick, if you actually check who these people are, most of them are not Hungarian, Hungarian people. They are foreign students who are actually generating some kind of sentiment that otherwise is not necessarily the daily agenda of the Hungarian people. Staying with Hungary, um, I'm gonna trigger you a little bit further than in the beginning. Because as a proud Hungarian and as a Zionist, I have kind of like a double-edged goal. Number one is to kill the mis misperception of Israel and the Jewish people. But on the other hand, when someone slanders my country, I get really angry. So when the foreign media is actually picturing my country as the dark spot for the Jewish people in Europe, and we are the worst people ever, in as much that someone actually told me that anti-Semitism is in my DNA and in the Hungarian people's DNA. Those are not happy moments, actually. So here is my, my thing. The ADL put out a report that actually shows that the actual violence against Jews in Hungary is very minimal, like almost nothing. We have stupid stereotypical jokes, but it stops there. And yet, the ADL also put out a press release in, in just a couple of months ago saying, how do European countries use anti-Semitism to their political agendas? I was very interested in that. Hungary was the second one in the line. And guess what was mentioned there? Why we are again so horrible? Because of the Soros campaign from 2015. Six years ago, a Soros campaign is still a topic. Again, my problem with this is not that Hungary is mentioned on that, but when we make a partisan issue about how we report about anti-Semitism, we've got a credibility check to make.
Because ADL should report about the, uh, about the anti-Semitic situation in Hungary, but then name also those left-leaning politicians or the far-right-leaning politicians who are actually in the European Parliament even, and yet they want to count the Jewish people in the, parliament, in the House of Parliament in Hungary. No, it's only about the current government. The only government in Hungary who actually first time ever apologized for our responsibility during the Shoah. So yes, let's talk about the problems, but don't cherry pick what is the problem. And the same is palpable in America, where during the last four years, every anti-Semitic attack was because of Trump, obviously. Every anti-Semitic attack. Now, the number of attacks are up by 500%. 500%, but it's obviously not President Biden's problem and on his account. So I really do not care for nobody's politics here, but the moment we make anti-Semitism a partisan issue, we failed the Jewish community and remember that. So I'm getting to the end of my presentation. I want to give some thoughts to ponder on in reference to the conference title, which is Antisemitism in Hungary, Perception and Reality. So as I said, while many, many Israeli, primarily left-leaning media outlets and also American mainstream outlets are picturing Hungary as um, the devil of all, let's be very un honest here. Did you see any tanks when you came into this conference? Did you see any police? helicopters, choppers, terrorists, against terrorist police and things. No, there are no tanks in front of Jewish institutions and events. Whereas in Brussels, where I lived for six years, the Jewish schools need to be protected by two tanks. Jewish kids need to be collected by a special bus taken to their kindergarten or school whatsoever. None of this is actually happening in, in, in Hungary. In the US is the same. Wherever you go to a shul, you are a target. There are really no violent attacks against Jews in Hungary, and I want you to remember that. Because it's one thing to say stupid jokes. Yes, okay, it's sad, nobody likes that. But it ends there. That person who is in the village in Hungary and going to talk about the uh, Jewish jokes will not go out and stab a Jew. But on the other hand, what Tamir yesterday mentioned, the Sarah Halimi case in France, that's huge. An elderly French woman was tortured in her home and then thrown out of the window because she was Jewish. The moment this happens in Hungary, call me back and I'm going to make a very, very different speech. But as long as in Western Europe, there's zero consequences for Jew hatred. But in Hungary, there is zero tolerance. And I understand. I understand that there is a minority group in Hungary who still have filled with hate or prejudice and so on. But a minority doesn't represent a country. Also, there is no BDS pressure against artists, academia, and businesses. Jewish businesses here in Hungary are not needing to afraid that tomorrow they're going to be shut down just because they are Jewish businesses. That's not the case in New York right now. In the Lower East Side, where I'm getting calls from, please help me with your organization because we are afraid. And also, I'm never actually getting death threats for being a Zionist in Hungary. But I do get when I'm in Brussels or when I'm in America. Again, Western, Amer Western Europe and America are very different uh, situation again, but I said in the beginning with some statistical points. So I try to be very, very objective towards my country. I really am. Nobody is perfect and we don't need to be perfect because otherwise there is no reason to wake up tomorrow, right? So like we need a goal and mission in life. So we have anti-Semitism, but it's extremely important to distinguish between the anti-Semitism that comes from ignorance which is primarily present in Hungary, and the anti-Semitism that is actually a conscious Jew hatred. So one of the organizations I'm working with, I'm gonna quickly mention, is End Jew Hatred. And basically the goal is to arrive to that situation what the BLM and the LGBTQ community could achieve, which is what? That if you are saying something that's slightly racist, you are canceled, you feel ashamed, you feel guilt because you feel you did something wrong. Today, when you make a 
comment that is absolutely Jew hater, anti Semitic, there's zero consequences. The business as usual, life goes on, nothing happens. And that has to be changed. So whoever is anti Semitic needs to feel ashamed about that. Whoever says anything against like Jews in, a, in that negative connotation should feel ashamed. And we are a little far from that yet, but we are getting there. Actually, a little anecdote as I'm closing, because Hungary is so horrible. So when I came back from New York now, three weeks ago, I made a little social experiment and I was putting on a t-shirt every day, something different that was either in Hebrew or an IDF shirt or saying Andrew hatred or like Shabbat Shalom or something that is visibly Jewish or pro-Israeli or anything. I was waiting for someone to harass me because that's what the news says, that I should be harassed. After two weeks, thanks God, I'm still here. Nobody harassed me. So that's that. The same cannot be said when I'm in New York or in Brussels, where I go to an underground rally or something. Obviously, I need to take off my necklace. Sometimes I actually, for journalistic purposes, I go for undercover missions. You need to put on a wig, otherwise you are being lynched. And I'm not kidding. The violence in these anti-Israel events are really, really palpable. Freedom of speech, last sentence on that before I conclude. There is a woman called Laila Khaled. I'm not sure if you're familiar with her name. Poster girl for freedom fighters. <laughs> but I would translate it, she's a terrorist. <laughs> she actually hijacked two planes. She then transformed her face that she's not recognizable and so on. Anyway, she's a terrorist, right? She was invited by San Francisco State University last October to give a speech because social justice and she's a freedom fighter. They did it because again, freedom of speech is allowed, right? There is one tiny problem. This woman as a terrorist and as a member of a terrorist group officially cannot enter the United States. But online, it's a whole different story because it's a very unregulated market, unregulated business. So with the movement Andrew Hatred, we actually put a pressure on Zoom not to allow this lecture to happen. And we used, you know, lawfare and the legal, actually, knowledge to do that. So eventually, Zoom canceled because they said it incites hate. So the organizers very quickly went to YouTube. So we started the pressure there. Thanks God also YouTube canceled. But I'm, let me emphasize again, it's a state university hosting a terrorist to educate the next generation. I hope this is never going to happen in my country because then I will be back for sure. My conclusion and your take home message is online media platforms are way more dangerous than we think. The content that you can disseminate at so such a fast paced, absolutely free, and the most dangerous thing, it's, you can do it in a very funny way with all the memes and GIFs and everything. So basically it becomes a game. What starts online doesn't stop online. People radicalize themselves online, then they go on the street and kill a person. So this is absolutely no joke. And freedom of speech here and there, in as much as I, thank God every day that I grew up in freedom already and not under a regime, it cannot be that it happens on the account of inciting to hate. So freedom of speech needs checks and balances. Nothing can be as free that actually it costs lives. So that is why I would very much welcome all the social media platforms, either to sign up for the IR definition and have that as a basic benchmark or come up with their own definition, but have something. Because all those influencers, when they go on the platform, they are not having any kind of consequences for spreading to hatred. So cyber hate must be prosecuted. There must be absolutely zero tolerance for online terrorism in all form. And there is some very cognitive dissonance here again. The profit-oriented companies should not self-regulate. I mean, you know the saying, follow the money, right? How dangerous is that, that these profit-oriented social media platforms are actually self-regulating themselves as to what is hate speech, what is anti-Semitism. So they are 
basically a village in a village. And that's not okay when it costs lives. And many people have mentioned education here, and I agree with that. Education is super important, but I have a very different approach. What we need is exactly what I said before, to educate like the BLM educates, like BDS educates, like LGBTQ plus minus whatever they educate, meaning every day they tell you why is it racist what you are saying? Why is it homophobic what you are th saying? So they educate the other side who is not in their community as to what constitutes racist, what constitutes homophobic. The Jewish community often assumes that the other side actually know what is a blood libel. Ask an average Hungarian what a blood libel is and they will look at you like, what are you talking about? And that's totally normal. We don't need to know everything about everyone, but that's where education comes in. So that I, as a Jewish person, like hypothetically, explain to you what blood libel is and why when you say that it's actually anti-Semitic. This is the education that we need. What is really anti-Semitism? So to conclude right now, I do believe that in Hungary, the situation is not horrible, really not. But it doesn't mean it cannot be because we are living in a big globalized village. So it's very, very hard to stop what information comes in. I really thank you for your attention and I hope I could serve you some added value here today. Thank you. Thank you, Virag, for your energetic presentation. <laughs> and then now, please feel free to ask uh, one of our presenters, uh, speakers, if you have any questions, my colleagues will bring the microphone to you. For Virag, it's a really passionate presentation. It was really good, thank you. But at the end, I did have a question when it comes to the Leila Khalid example. Is somebody who is a terrorist always a terrorist? In other words, the examples that come to mind are Menachem Begin, who became a prime minister and won the Nobel Prize for Peace. Yasser Arafat with, Pia, with Fatah did exactly the same thing. So is there a guilt that carries on through all of your life or can there be change? I think it's an excellent question. And I recently wrote an article about cancel culture, which I think is a horrible phenomenon. Phenomena, yeah. Because for example, I'm sure that there are so many things that I said at age 15 that I would be not proud today. And probably I'm saying things today that I won't be proud at age 50. And that's a natural development of, of our human features, right? And cancel culture goes against that. So to answer your question, people can change. I do believe that people can change. But the problem with Laila Khaled, that today she's still saying the same thing. So she has no remorse. She didn't change her agenda. She would still hijack a plane today. That's what she said. So, you know, I can forgive your sins if you are actually apologizing for that. But as long as you keep your agenda, you remain a terrorist. So I hope that answered your question. Um, a question to Laszlo Kürti. Um, um, great fan, great fan of your writing. Um, uh, would you please t tell, tell us about, sorry for my voice, tell us a little bit more about uh, the reception of this music. Uh, who listens to, um, is a kind of punk music, uh, young, uh, who are the audience? And how widespread, how well received uh, these songs? Because the Mujikash is something different. It's a, it's a horse of a different color. Completely. Uh, I assume the, the, the reader, the listeners are different. So would you please tell us a little bit about reception, how we're received, who are the listeners, uh, do we know anything about them? Um, and the second question to Ruth and, uh, and uh, Janusz Godot, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. These are really fascinating uh, presentation, and third presentation as well. And uh, here, uh, I, I, uh, not a suggestion, but also a question about the distinction between West and East, Western Europe and Eastern Europe. We know it from the late 1980s. We always talked about the West is good, the East is, uh, well, something went wrong with, 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 with uh, you know, with Eastern Europe, who knows, from the 13th century or something. And 
you know, today, as far as I see, you can see many Wests and many Easts. When you talk about West, even anti-Semitism, the sources of anti-Semitism, reaction to anti-Semitism, are very different to Denmark say, than, say, Portugal or Spain. And Eastern Europe also, Poland is with this very Catholic tradition, or you can talk about the blood, uh, bloodland anti-Semitism, right? The bloodland, the typical, you know, here, oh, which was under the, the dual occupation, and countries which were not. Um, a Czech is, example is very different from the Hungarian example. And why is it coming up? It, I, 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 I'm asking both questions. Is it perhaps, and how far do we take, um, I don't like the social background, or with all terms, class into consideration? In the, in the case of Germany, for example, we know um, academic or upper class anti-Semitism is completely different, or completely different uh, when it, uh, you know, boycott or, uh, or, or talking about um, uh, not inviting Jewish scholars or Israeli scholars to certain events. It's a different kind of anti-Semitism than, uh, than uh, going to cemeteries and destroying graves or blowing up synagogues. And the social background of the anti-Semites are also very different. In the, in the German case, it is usually the radical right which do radical at uh, this point. This point is usually uh, who are, who are or historically engaged in the traditional anti-Semitic practice. Uh, so, so when it comes to countering this the different branches of anti-Semitism, and this is a question to you, Ruth. Uh, do you take this into consideration? So do you take uh, the social background, uh, the educational background, even the gender or geographical background, rural, rural city divide into, into consideration when you are encountering different brands or different branches of anti-Semitism? Thank you very much. Sorry for the um. Look, I, uh, I researched uh, popular music a few years ago, and I uh, managed to do quite a number of interviews with these guys. And of course, pop music is, is, is strange uh, because it, it plays both, both cards. It could be very, very global and very urban phenomena and very, um, very much of a, in, in line with international standards, but it could be also very, very nationalistic and it could be also very extremist as well. But the music that I, I studied were, the, um, were the, the extremist kind, the kind of a skinhead music that started in, a, in the 1980s, early 1980s in Hungary, and the way it, it continues uh, up today. And of course, it is a counterculture. In a, in, a, in a sense that uh, these groups uh, operate uh, within certain clubs and circles. And um, the people who go there are not, not, not big groups. You know, anywhere from um, 50 to 200, 150, 200. But uh, it's dangerous because it, it goes outside of this circle. I mean, now it's on, it's on the internet all over. And people listen to them, and some of the messages go way beyond their own immediate uh, clubs and, and, uh, and circle. And I think this is why, why we have to uh, uh, pay attention to this. And let me just tell you an example. Uh, I don't know if you know, remember the scene when uh, our, our minister president, Viktor Orban, received his shot, his vaccination on a television. I don't know if any of you, if you know that scene. It was a very, very interesting scene. He received the Chinese Sinopharm vaccine. And uh, the doctor who administered the, the vaccine tells Viktor Orban that he's getting the, this Sinopharm. And what does Viktor Orban say? He says, very interesting, he says, Sharkányok nak sharkányfű. Meaning that he, he referred to the Chinese vaccine as this powerful symbol, the dragon, which is the Chinese symbol. Do you know where this line comes from? From early 1980s, from a song by Mushoi, one of the most radical uh, national, so, national socialist punk band in Hungary. And the original line is, 
sárkányoknak sárkányfű, cigányoknak bőrfejű. Okay. So it was totally shocking to me, and my wife says, why are you, why are you so shocked, why are you laughing? And I, asked, and I told her the story that why this is so strange that uh, you would have something like this coming from his, his mouth. Maybe he knew it. I'm pretty sure he knew it, where it comes from. So obviously it's, and of course, it's an international phenomenon. Some of these groups go to the West, go to, the, go to, to minority Hungarian regions in, uh, in neighboring states. And some of these uh, national socialist, socialist bands come to Hungary as well. So it's much, much bigger than what you think. Okay. I, I kept my presentation a little bit lighter because uh, I thought we had a lot of speakers and I didn't want to kind of uh, tire the audience. But since you wanted an answer, I can give a little bit more detailed one. There are many differences between the East and the West and the issue of antisemitism. But in the, in the end of the day, and the bottom line is that both East and West, they're human beings. And human beings have both goodness and hate in their heart. And basically, antisemitism is nothing else than hate. You talked about socioeconomic uh, status and so forth. Just like violence, for example, violence towards women, we say that there is no difference. It can happen both in rich families and, and poor families. It's the same thing. Uh, it's not a matter of percentages, it's a matter of what someone carries in his heart and the prejudice, obviously, uh, that, that carry. Uh, for example, in the East, you can say you have more of the traditional, the old-fashioned antisemitism, where in the West is more of the anti-Israel type of uh, antisemitism. But I want to say that um, basically the, the way that I understand antisemitism is um, um, the re in the West, the love... Uh, they love uh, minorities, they protect minorities. There is a very strong commitment, as I said before, towards human rights. But these minorities, they want them to be small and uh, they want them to be victims. As long as they are victims, oh, I want to protect you, poor you, you know? But if they see Israel as a strong nation that knows how to defend itself, then it's no longer a victim. And then therefore, they don't feel they have any responsibility towards them or they don't feel maybe the empathy. So, um, but the other thing I wanted to say is that um, both the East and the West, they're not uh, monolithic, you know. In the East, you have a huge variety of people with huge variety of uh, political and social and religious um, perceptions, and it's the same thing in the West. The West is not this big, bad uh, wolf, you know. There's some very wonderful uh, people, obviously. There are wonderful things going on. There's a very real commitment to fighting anti-Semitism and fighting... Uh, uh, hate in general, but obviously there, there is also a very real percentage of people that maybe have a very wrong perception and they need to be educated. I hope I answer your, your question. There are differences, but it's not an East and West. For me, it is a matter of the heart of a human being and also is a matter that in every single nation, in every single religion, in every single um, geographical area, you find certain percentages and you cannot, uh, just like, the one thing I agree with you is that you cannot generalize, and the minority or the small percentage that you see in every single community doesn't necessarily mean that you have to generalize about the whole community. And especially if that community is serious about fight fighting that hate and fighting that anti-Semitism. Thank you. Is there another person? I don't know where our, sorry, our, our moderator. So your question was uh, how I see the difference between Western and Eastern approaches, political attitudes, and why I, if, if, if I, um, you refer to quite a lot of things, so if I can summarize your question, you ask how do I, de how do I see the difference between uh, Western political culture regarding anti-Semitism and Eastern political culture uh, uh, regarding anti-Semitism. So uh, the, the basic difference uh, I see between West and East, and by East I mean uh, the former Soviet bloc countries, uh, basically, with Germany uh, being a special case because East Germany was former Soviet bloc and West Germany was not. Uh, but anyway, uh, where I see the basic difference is that 
uh, in, in Western Europe and in the Western world, United States, Canada, etc., uh, uh, a culture of self-reflection self prevailed. Uh, uh, they recognized their responsibility regarding the Holocaust. These countries uh, acknowledge their the responsibility. Uh, if you remember the statement of Jacques Chirac in 1995 or something when he declared that France was responsible uh, for the deparations of the Velodrome d'Hiver in 1942 and he recognized the French responsibility for deporting more than uh, 20,000 Jews without French citizenship. So it was uh, very high profile, uh, very mediatized uh, declaration of French responsibility. And later came uh, these countries recognize uh, their responsibility for uh, colonization, uh, for, uh, for anti-women uh, policies, for, uh, for neglecting policies about handicapped people, etc. So in the Western world, no, it is a time of self-reflection, uh, it's, it's a time of soul-searching. Uh, and the nation uh, has a strong role in it because the nation, the French nation, the other nations has a responsibility. So this is a time of soul-searching. Yes, we are uh, responsible for oppression for different minorities. So it is a great time of, of, of all those who uh, can de who declare themselves as oppressed minorities. Whereas in the Eastern world, it did not happen. It's not a time of soul searching. It, it, it is a time of reproaching that you are victimizers and we are victims. The nations of Eastern Europe regard themselves, regard themselves still as victims. As I put it in my lecture, here the grievances of the nations are too deep and the crimes committed by these nations also too deep to, confronted, to be confronted with. So they may remain, they remain, the nations of Eastern Europe basically remain at the, with the old model. With the old model of nationalism or nation uh, was victim of the others or nation was victim of the perfidy of the others. Just like today, Hungary is the victim uh, of Brussels perfidy and Soros perfidy, etc., etc. So it's still a culture of confrontation, while in the Western world uh, it is a culture of soul searching. So basically, the nations of Eastern Europe still say we are victims, and we, we have been victims, and we are still victims. And uh, the nations of Western Europe recognize that we have been victimizers and we, we were victimizers for a long time. This is where I see a big difference between these two cultures, uh, which does not mean that I subscribe fully uh, to this uh, soul-searching culture of the West, because as I see, it had been hijacked, uh, because it's more than easy to declare that I am victim and in the name of my victimhood, you have to uh, pray, for, you have to kneel in front of me, I am the victim and you are the victimizer. So uh, speaking in the name of colonizers, of, of colonized and speaking in, in the name of various victim groups, it's very easy. So this uh, uh, culture of self-searching and self-reflection can be hijacked very easily. And this is exactly what happened with the Palestinian case. The Palestinian picked up the victimhood issue and they are the number one victims. They are the kings of victims. They are, the, they are more victims than anyone else. And the Jews had been turned into victimizers. The Jews had been victims of the Holocaust. Uh, we were turned into victimizers. Now they are victimizing the Palestinians. It is, it is being said. So uh, this culture of soul searching, this culture of self-reflections, which is so deep and which is so venerable and so respectable, in many cases had been hijacked. And first of all, in, it, it had been hijacked in the, in the Israel-Palestinian conflict. Uh, the Palestinians are uh, depicted as the number one victims. And this is a complete hijacking and a complete distortion of this victim-victimizer culture. 
That's how I can summarize. So I will be as respectful as my diplomatic skills allow me, but you are actually hurting me a little bit, both on my nationalistic sense and as a Zionist. So when you say that the West is taking responsibility, I never had France actually saying that they had a responsibility in the Shoah. I never hear the Belgians saying that they had a responsibility or the Dutch. It's always the Polish and the Hungarians and the Eastern Europeans. And no matter how many times we apologize, we are always the devil and the evil. But let's be very honest what happened during the Shoah. The French collected their Jews, put them on a train and sent them to Eastern Europe to die. The same for the Dutch, the same for everyone on the Western beautiful liberal countries. So I appreciate their soul searching, but when they soul search and then they apologize and then they still let a Jew being killed in that country, is that really soul searching? And I don't mind that Hungarians don't soul search anymore because we wake up apologizing, go to sleep apologizing, even that won't be enough. But I prefer this because in my country at least no Jew can be stabbed. No Jew can die here without any consequences. And that's way more important for me than PR stunt and apologizing publicly and yet not protecting your minority groups. I think that's a way better forward. And the other thing is how, that's where my Zionist soul is actually being hurt of what you said, that basically Jews are now and Israel is now the victimizer. Very, very easy equation. When the Jew is actually on a stumbling knee, as we know from the quote, that's a good Jew. When a Jew is a strong Jew, he's a horrible Jew. Very, very easy example. If you get $500,000 and I get $500,000 and you decided to spend, I'm going to make you the good guy now, you decided to send on research and development and hospitals and everything beautiful and the Iron Dome, and I decide to dig tunnels and get, you know, rockets and uh, make my children terrorists and teach them that one dead Jew plus one dead Jew equals two dead Jews, then why, am I, why are you responsible for my stupidity? So it cannot be that we make the Palestinians the ultimate victims, whereas they get way more money than Israel does. And the fact that Israel has the Iron Dome, Israel would not exist if it would not have the Iron Dome after all the rockets that are being flied. So it's very easy to say that Israel is the victimizer, but what was before the chicken or the egg? So that's my point here, because I think this is very, very important and, and we need to be correct and honest here. Thank you very much. My question is to all the members in that panel. And uh, I was left with a very bad feeling after that panel. The picture that you presented was very encouraging and pessimistic. So saying that, I have uh, three questions. First, uh, is there any optimism still left in you? Is there still a light to be seen at the horizon? Uh, second, uh, accepting the fact that perhaps the situation in uh, Hungary is better than in other countries is there something that can be learned from the Hungarian case and can be applied to, to other countries? And the third question, which is more elaborate, well, everybody speaks about education and the need to educate, the, especially the younger generation. And usually when speaking about education, we are speaking about formal education. I mean, making like, school programs and things like that. But let's say, let's put a, a hypothetical example. Let's, assuming that you have $1 million dedicated for education and you are not, uh, you don't have to account on the government to subsidize you and everything else. How would you spend that million dollars between formal education in school and non-formal education, like in the social media and in other places, which would be more effect, effect which will get more effects and which will, will result in the better fruits in that, in that struggle against anti-Semitism. Thank you. Come. You can stay. 
Okay, so I, I tried to be a little bit positive. I hope that didn't uh, depress you, okay? I started by saying that there is a huge problem. Anti-Semitism is a huge problem. Uh, I have uh, seen uh, terror attacks. I, I know the effect it has. I, I understand now how real anti-Semitism is. I said that in my own uh, country, unfortunately, we have very high levels of anti-Semitic views, but uh, thank God, you know, today we have a very strong commitment. Things are changing. Our education system is changing. That commitment is not from one or two people. This is like throughout the society, both from the right and from the left. And I think that in Hungary, when I look at Hungary, I do see some very good positive steps. Um, yesterday we had uh, the rabbis who quoted the Bible. I, I, I wanted to also quote it, but I don't know how to say it exactly. But basically that, uh, you know, repentance in Jewish and in, uh, and in Christian theology is very important. You cannot just take someone and just because you committed a sin, I have to be hitting you, hitting you, hitting you, you know. If you see real steps of repentance, the repentance in both the Jewish and in the Christian theology means returning back to what is good. So if you see real steps of repentance, turning away from what is bad and doing the right thing, you have to accept that person, you know. You can't just keep on reminding him of his past or reminding him of his uh, sins. So me, as an educator, as someone who is working towards change, I, I see the negativity, I see the problem, and I'm just trying to work towards solutions. Um, the other thing I want to say, you said about the formal education and non-formal. Well, if you start from a formal education, you start from primary schools and you start from secondary schools, you go all the way to universities. Universities today, unfortunately, Western Europe, just like you, we mentioned the, edu the education uh, system um, in uh, the US, unfortunately, it's not that it's everyone, it's not 100% of a problem, but unfortunately, there's a very strong, small minority that calls extremism inside the universities. And um, so that's why you have to start from formal education. And then obviously, if you do a very good foundation, you need less work to be done later. But of course, education, just like any other subject, is not uh, just five or six or seven years of education, is, is ongoing. Thank you. I think these are excellent questions. And that's what I think we really, really need to, to ponder. Um, what the Western world could learn from Hungary, I would, if I could, I would make anyone and everyone who has an anti-Semitic remark, or even worse, a physical assault or anything on a Jewish person, I would make them a choice to either go to jail, and I know it doesn't sound so good, but either go to jail or spend a day at a Holocaust museum. That's what I would do. I would send them to a Holocaust museum or make them meet with a Holocaust survivor as long as we have survivors. Because I really believe that the majority of the anti-Semitic um, remarks comes from ignorance. And the moment you would meet someone who has a tattooed number on their hands and they can actually explain what happened to them, we saw people also in the, in the US, you know, neo-Nazis eventually hugging a survivor. I'm not saying we can change everyone, but if we don't even try, we can't. Most people who are extreme, I don't want to be in going into psychology, but they had some sort of trauma. They come from an abusive family or something. They become hateful. They don't born to be hateful, you know? So I think we need to go back to the compassionate side. And I'm definitely not for one who believes in this uber liberal approach that hug your enemies and they're gonna hug you back eventually. So I'm not gonna hug a terrorist. But when we talk about ignorant people, I do believe that there is a way to educate them this way. Go to the Yad Vashem, face the pictures. So that's, I think, really important. And when it comes to education, Europe is again in a way better situation, especially Eastern Europe. So what very many, many people in Hungary might not comprehend that the US education system right now is primarily financed by Qatar and the likes. And that's very important because if a state funded university is getting their money from very heavily problematic states, it influences the curriculum system. And this is why there are so much Jew hatred being allowed. Like there is a critical race theory that is now a big discussion in the US. Basically, they are teaching kids how privileged they are and it's being ranked. The most privileged person is if you are white. 
the, actually even more privileged if you are white and a woman. And then there is a privilege of white and being a Jew. And then obviously the least privilege is someone who is black. So this is how kids are being taught. And as a white kid at age 10, he needs to apologize for his whiteness. And if he is Jewish, he needs to apologize the double because he is white and Jew and privileged. So these are the, the big, big problems that we are facing on the other side. And so I believe that that is why Hungary, in as much as you know, we want to be more liberal looking or something, I believe that the conservative values, unfortunately, are still the way forward. That's how we can conserve you know, some kind of moral and ethical uh, compass in our lives. So I hope that gives you some, some sort of answers, but I think your question is absolutely the good questions. Uh, can we learn from something uh, what Hungary has to offer? No. Let's face it. I think Hungary is a bad example and I wouldn't look for Hungarians uh, to teach about anti-Semitism or about hatred in general. Uh, let's not be self-conceited. I, I think what we have to do is we have to learn from many different examples and try to take the best part from them all. And I had, I had one word in my lecture, which was evil. And I think, I think xenophobia, prejudice, greed, hatred, it, it, it is part of us, let's face it, as, as human beings. So can we change it? Can, can we change human nature? As an anthropologist, I would say it's very difficult, but we, we have been chased as, as a human species, we, we have been changing in the past few 10, 20, 30,000. Uh, I mean, we are not cannibals, so we are not eating up each other, but there are some still problems. And again, let's not kid ourselves. Education is not, not a single bullet theory to solve things. You have to have a very good legal system in place that stop people, stupid and, and evil people, doing from what they are doing. And education is, is only a minor part of this. Uh, you have to have uh, positive discrimination as well in terms of, of, of putting money where, where you really need it so people, people don't turn against uh, uh, each other. And I think there are many, many other things that you have to put, put into place in order to stop evil from, from doing its, its, its harm. And education, unfortunately, is, 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 is a limited resource. And it's, like you say, it's not always the best way to, uh, uh, to do it. Is there a hope? There is, in the long run. OK. Do you want to reflect, Mr. Gado? OK, go on. I, uh, can you hear me? Uh, I would like to return to my uh, previous statement uh, uh, regarding your question uh, what, uh, Western, uh, what Western nations can learn from Hungary since uh, Western there is a very high wave of uh, aggression against Jews and Hungary and other Eastern nations are uh, peaceful and here uh, Jews are not harmed and uh, physical aggression is very exceptional while in Western world in, in New York it's much more uh, frequent. Uh, I would like to return uh, to my previous statement that here in the countries of Eastern Europe uh, the culture of self-reflection is not prevalent and I think uh, uh, blaming the other, as in the culture of these East European nation, uh, is, is the is the major uh, be way of behavior. Is uh, not a major behavior, not a ripe a major behavior. Uh, if you blame the others all the time, if you say that you are guilty, uh, we are not guilty. Uh, it's, it's somewhat a childish behavior in the, the attitude of the Western nations who recognize their own fault. It's more of a behavior uh, of an adult person. 
uh, and I would remain here if I would not see that uh, this culture of soul searching uh, and this culture uh, of self reflection had been hijacked. Uh, I would appreciate this culture of self-reflection if I did not see that it had been hijacked. So it, it is uh, very much uh, exaggerated. If a white child has to repent his whiteness uh, and he is, uh, uh, he, is, he, he is to be blamed, he is uh, sort of responsible for his privilege and he is made responsible for uh, let's say the slavery of the 19th century, then this culture uh, of uh, self-reflection, this culture uh, of soul searching had been hijacked, had been uh, turned into something bad. Uh, so since in Hungary, the culture of self-reflection does not prevail, uh, and in the Western world, they are struggling with this problem of soul searching that it uh, somehow uh, slid into something wrong. Uh, it, uh, uh, it has been hijacked, it had been perverted. Uh, so my impression that these countries who are struggling with the problems of self-reflection cannot really learn something from a country which did not reach yet this phase of self-reflection. This is my answer briefly. Uh, sorry, uh, John, do you want to re reflect to that? John O'Sullivan? Actually, my comment is to you, Jeffrey, and to Virag. Uh, everyone spoke about Leila Khaled. Uh, yes, she is a terrorist, and uh, she still supports the PFLP, which is a designated terror organization in the EU. In 2017, she appeared physically, not in Zoom, in the European Parliament, invited by um, the bloc, uh, the Spanish organization, which is... Uh, yes, well, that my, my, next, my next words were like Spanish extreme left organization. I said, Spanish NGO, Spanish NGO, by the way, funded by the Spanish government, uh, next to Leila Khaled, invited by the GLU, the le far left uh, um, uh, EU bloc, EU parties bloc. The interesting thing that everyone spoke about, she is being a terrorist of a designated organization. No one spoke about the fact that in her speech inside the European, European Parliament, she actually used anti-Semitic tropes. She actually said, the Zionists control the world, control the water. She said those things. No one even uh, uh, cared about it. So uh, the question if someone is a terrorist or, uh, er, or not, is not even a, an issue when, when you're still believing that Zionists slash Jews just replace the world, uh, control the world and are responsible to 9-11 uh, uh, to or all uh, such things. Thank you. to the director of the Danube Institute, Mr. General Salas. Uh, thank you. No, just on the uh, point of the contrast between the culture of self-reflection and the culture of denial, uh, obviously, um, it, uh, we, we obviously want people to have a culture of truth, a culture which involves looking at their own actions and behavior and motives and other people with the same element of realism accepting their own crimes um, and judging other crimes um, appropriately, crimes of others. Um, your qualification to your own uh, argument, uh, in, uh, where, you, um, where you stressed that the culture of self-reflection has become, in some cases, a culture essentially of, I forget the phrase you used, the culture of, uh, well, this culture of self-accusation, um, um, of a neurotic kind almost. Now, I think that is true, of course, and uh, particularly uh, damaging in one sense. Um, if we look at, for example, the exa if we look at the debate at the moment of, on slavery that's taking place in Great Britain, um, 
the culture of self-accusation has become very marked because uh, there has been almost there's been almost no acknowledgement of the role that the British played in ending the slave trade, slavery at home, and the slave trade in the world. Uh, that's an extremely important part of the story for all kinds of reasons. So, in order to have a culture of truth, you've got to acknowledge sometimes your own virtues as well as your vices. And does, doesn't that also apply to the other culture, the culture of, of denial? Uh, there's no doubt that, the, that great crimes occurred in this part of the world, um, in, in all of the countries, and there's no doubt that, that, that sometimes states and officials and others took part in them and have responsibility for them. But there's also no doubt that these countries were victims and groups in them were victims in this period. And that obviously is most clear in relation to the, the Gulag period when the, the countries really had uh, no, act, no choice, but, uh, and actors in them did have a choice, and some acted badly and some acted courageously. It's just that um, we cannot, in a sense, deny that there are victims, and that sometimes we ourselves are victims. Um, in, in these cases, and that has to be acknowledged along with the crimes that we may have participated in or have some kind of responsibility for. Just uh, briefly, uh, yes, uh, uh, these countries and sometimes these nations were victims and were victimizers. And the most problematic uh, uh, when they were both at the same time if you take the Polish case, uh, when uh, Poland was certainly the victim of uh, two horrendous regime, the Stalin and the Hitler regime, and they, uh, the Poles regard themselves as the Christ of the nations. Uh, they suffered so much at the hand of the Nazis and the hand of the Bolsheviks. And certainly, the Poles were the victims of these uh, both cruel regimes. At the same time, when the Nazis persecuted the Jews, uh, the Poles very often benefited. There were these infamous Schmalzovniks who know, denounced the Jews to the Nazis and who then profited uh, from it that they acquired the belongings of the Jews. So at the very same time, uh, they were victims and they were victimizers. And very difficult to absorb, very difficult to uh, to reflect on a psychological level, very difficult. Uh, and if you take the case of Hungary, which uh, at the time was an ally of Nazi Germany, it's a little bit less problematic, but the Hungarians have just as many troubles of self-reflections self as the Poles. It's not a coincidence that they are so good friends and they are so close to each other in terms of nationalism. So yes, you are right. The, the great problem is in this region of the world, unlike uh, Germany, say, which was uniquely a victimizer and nothing else. In this region, nations were both, and this is very hard to, uh, uh, to elaborate, to, to, uh, 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 to reflect on. Thank you. Uh, any comments from Ruth? Okay. Yes, I want to make a last comment. Just to say that, um, just very briefly, that uh, one of my fellow uh, panelists, he mentioned uh, basically specific, um, um, a specific person that he's our, our, our basically our, uh, our own partner. So I just wanted to address it and to say that Rabbi Koves is, part, is our partner as a European Jewish Association. He's, uh, he's considered our, our biggest partner, basically both in Hungary, but also across Europe. Uh, we work with them very closely. And if you allow me, I just wanted to say that I, I don't believe this is the case. Uh, Rabbi Koves does not support uh, uh, the government or Orban, the prime minister, because of uh, any financial support or anything like that. Uh, other Jewish communities and Jewish organizations receive even a bigger amount of funding. Uh, our work uh, is both with uh, the left and the right, as I said. We, both, um, we are looking for solutions, we're looking to educate, and we're looking to see what can be done to address the issue of anti-Semitism. And education for us is the key because it's just the foundation. And as I said, from that foundation, you build everything else. So, thank you. And thank you all of the speakers for your presentation and speeches, and thank you all of our guests for your kind attendance.